the prairie, the hearth, shelter, Frank Lloyd Wright's own home, the playroom for his six children, Lloyd, John, Catherine, who became my mother, David, Francis, and Llewellyn. The place for fireside stories, tales of magic from his mother's Welsh past, like the tales of Taliesin himself. Taliesin was a legendary bard born out of some strange fish pond in ancient Wales. Taliesin is Welsh for shining brow. And Taliesin would become Wright's home on the shining brow of this Wisconsin hill. To Wright, Taliesin was a Celtic talisman of mythic Wales, an inspiration for his future architecture. His childhood was a restless one. He lived in six towns and four states before he turned 11. But this was the land he best remembered as a boy. Spring Green, Wisconsin. The valley the Lloyd Jones family farmed. His mother's family. The God Almighty Jones, as they called them. They worshipped here in Welsh as Unitarians. Early in my career, I was a very arrogant young man. I was so sure of my ground and my star that I had to choose between a, an honest arrogance and a hypocritical humility. And I deliberately chose an honest arrogance, and I've never been sorry. An arrogance confirmed in his family motto, truth against the world. It was the architect of this simple family church, Joseph Silsby, who offered the young country boy his first job, an apprenticeship that took right south to the rising industrial city of Chicago. For his first home in the growing suburb of Oak Park, the 22-year-old architect used a freer Midwest rendering of the East Coast shingle style. It is the spring. It is the sweetest spring of springs. It is the time for hope. Now begin. The words of Louis Sullivan, the pioneering Chicago architect who became Wright's hero, his Lieber Meister. His decorative style so captivated Wright that he was soon at work as Sullivan's chief draftsman. I became to Sullivan, said Wright, the pencil in his hand. Sullivan wrote in kindergarten chats, What is an architect? I think I am an architect. Imagination giving natural pattern to structure itself. The form following the function. The work should be organic. What do you mean by organic? I will tell you later on. A golden organic arch. For the Chicago World's Fair of 1893, Sullivan built the Transportation Building. Of the fair's official neoclassical building styles, Sullivan said, an appalling calamity. The damage wrought by this will last for half a century. Twenty years before, Sullivan, along with other adventurous young architects, had come out west to rebuild a city destroyed by the great Chicago fire. The past lay everywhere in ruins, old architectural styles burnt out and gutted. Wright shared Sullivan's impatience with the hold of the old world on American architecture. We really have no past except the older countries. And if we could only get rid of their past, we'd have a future. And until we do, rid ourselves of that past, I can't see that our future is going to be any more than a repetition with a new face, new clothes, new appearances of a very old, old thing. But around the World's Fair, 
were other exhibits from ancient lands that touched right deeply, like the Hoho Den, a sheltering temple from Japan, and the massive Mayan temples, the ancient architecture of the Americas. The decorative patterns and the wide overhanging roof of the Turkish pavilion. Architecture that seemed to write honest and integral to its time and place. 1893 was also the year that Wright, at 26, took off on his own after working for Sullivan for seven years. This was his first independent commission, the Winslow House. Here, in Oak Park's neighboring suburb of River Forest, were the beginnings of a new architecture, the nucleus of what would come to be called the Prairie House. Wright's richly carved oak door opened to reveal the family hearth, placed here like a sacred fire. The traditional Victorian ingle nook was here framed, almost church-like, by an arcade of delicate arches. The carved pattern was derived from nature along the lines laid down by Louis Sullivan. The excitement that Wright's first home provoked greatly encouraged the 26-year-old architect. The Winslow House, it was a terrific sensation. The whole town would stream around that way on Sunday, and they couldn't finish it without keeping people out. Same thing with the next house I built. Mr. Moore, who was a lawyer, came to me for a house and said he didn't want anything like that Winslow house, so he would have to go around back ways to the train to avoid being laughed at. So he got a half-timber house, but he got a porch on a half-timber house, which never happened before. I lived diagonally across the street from Mr. Moore, but he always thought that house was good half-timber. Wright's own house became a constant experiment in building. To the side of his original home, he added a studio for his expanding architectural practice. It was a place to think afresh. I inhale great drafts of space. The east and west are mine, and the north and south are mine. I am larger, better than I thought, he read in Whitman's Leaves of Grass. And the poet's plea, oh, to realize space would become Wright's life commitment. His mother, an always forceful presence in his life, had willed him to be an architect even before his birth. In 1889, at the age of 21, Wright married Catherine Tobin, and their family would soon grow to six. Here Wright set himself the task of rethinking the Victorian home. Slowly he refined his ideas against the real demands of family life. A formal dining room was always a great opportunity for design. Again, Wright's decoration derived from Sullivan's love of intertwining natural forms. But in his children's playroom, where Catherine had her neighborhood kindergarten, there were signs of new directions. I think I had a great advantage over almost any man I've ever met when my mother, who was a teacher, my father was a preacher, when she went to the centennial and saw there the Frable gifts and learned that Frable believed a child should not be allowed to draw from nature, to boondoggle with effects until he had learned and forms that behind it produced those effects. And there's a little gibbet here like this on which you hung the cube, the sphere. Then you were to make designs. And you sat there and wove patterns. 
By the pattern, you've got a sense of rhythm, as you would if you were playing the piano. instead of looking at things, you see. And that was my gift from my mother when I was a child. It was a gift that inspired this remarkable structure, the Larkin Administration Building of 1903, which only survives in this film taken by Wright himself and in a few dozen photographs. The Larkin Company of Buffalo, New York was a prosperous mail order firm serving the entire United States with soap and household goods. It was a building conceived from the inside out. Its architectural innovations were legion. Advanced air conditioning, open workspaces. Each item of furniture a product of total design. began to come clear to me in the Larkin building, of course, this idea that the space within the building, within the structure, should come through and be evident as the reality of that building, not the walls and the roof so much. Wright called the architecture of the Larkin building the grammar of the Protestant. And the thing that came to me by instinct in the Larkin building began to come consciously in Unity Temple. Unity Temple of 1904 was in fact two buildings, a secular meeting place linked by a wide entrance to the church proper. Wright turned a limited budget to heroic advantage by building in poured concrete. He was now 37. Now when I finished Unity Temple I had, I was conscious of the idea. I knew I had the beginning of a great thing, great truth in architecture, and that now architecture could be free. Unlike all the other Oak Park churches in a suburb known affectionately as saintly rest, Unity Temple achieved its function without a Gothic tower from the Middle Ages. The Presbyterian church across the street was only a few years older than Wright's massive geometry. ceiling went out and you saw right outside under the ceiling. And when the walls became screens, features, and the whole room came through as, a, as an essential fact and truth. Embraced and integrated by ornamental banding, the interior space of Unity Temple was a masterstroke. I had an idea that I had discovered something tremendously important. And what was it? That the reality of a building 
did not consist in the walls and the roof of that structure, but in this space in here to be lived in. There was the reality. Well, I built it. Meanwhile, Wright's domestic work was growing by up to a dozen homes a year in seemingly endless variations of invention, a continuing quest for the ideal and perfect house. This one, a few doors down from Wright's own Oak Park home, was for the successful banker, Arthur Hurtley. Even in this two-story house, Wright continued to develop his feelings for the prairie-hugging horizontal, achieved here under a low-hipped roof by different colored bands of Roman brick. Nothing seemed more important for the young architect than the sense of shelter invoked by a welcoming hearth. It's fire burning deep within the living spaces of the home. Wright had begun to break the dark box of the Victorian house. More and more, he observed, light is the great beautifier of the building. Wright achieved many of his architectural effects by a process of elimination. Japanese prints intrigued me and taught me much, he wrote, by the elimination of the insignificant. Japanese art, I found, really did have organic character. It was nearer to the earth and nature, therefore more nearly modern, as I saw it, than any European civilization alive or dead. The sweeping roof lines and the projecting eaves of the Bradley house, so evocative of Japanese designs, reached perfection in another home. The Ward Willets house of 1902. For right, a little height on the prairie was enough to look like much, much more. Certainly the Willets house was the first great prairie house. And here you'll find the first statement in modern architecture from grade to coping. And when you get into this idea of eliminating the containment, which is the box, reaching out and amplifying space and dragging things in from the outside, you really have entered a new realm of architecture which has never existed in the world before. Natural colors, the soft, warm tones of autumn leaves and earth comprised Wright's palette for the Susan Lawrence Dana House in Springfield, Illinois. It was a dream home upon which Wright lavished every facet of his creative skill. At the entrance, an homage to mother architecture in terracotta by the sculptor Richard Bach, one of the several artists Wright gathered around him. Here, every item of furniture was designed. Room partitions were dissolved into one great flowing space. 
Although Bach's water fountain still looked over its shoulder to the Victorian past, Wright's leaded glass windows were determinately his. The natural forms of ripening sumac became a series of vertical abstractions in the colors of a prairie fall. Wright loved to celebrate the lowly weed. Above the high back chairs of the dining room, Wright commissioned a frieze by the artist George Niedekin. And Wright himself designed a series of suspended butterfly lamps in leaded glass. Susan Dana was the first in a series of rich and singular women to commission Wright. But a client's budget was no hindrance to Wright's imagination. Set amongst the traditional suburban homes of its comfortable contemporaries, thrust the cantilever slabs of this modest but astonishing home, the Gale House of 1908. Wright's love of the prairie horizontals also produced the very urban Roby House of 1909. The cantilevered brick balconies softened the growing traffic sounds of the 20th century and gave the rooms a sense of quietness on a busy city street. I want to look out and down to my neighbors without having them invade my privacy, requested the young engineer, Frederick Roby, of his architect. Lighting, heating, and ventilation were all superbly integrated. The roof overhangs shadowed out the midsummer sun, but allowed its winter rays to warm the great rooms. In counterpoint to one of the long, low rooms, Wright designed an enclosure of high back chairs, creating an intimate inner space for dining. To emphasize the building's horizontal sweep, even the mortar between the red Roman bricks was raked away. To many, the Roby House seemed anchored to its street like a great ship. In fact, Wright actually used steel from a Navy cruiser in its construction. The elimination of the inessential. No downspouts. Wright believed that the Roby House was one of his greatest achievements. It was the end of an extraordinary chapter. From large to small, Wright had designed over 150 homes by 1909. His famous prairie houses had even borne a school of Midwest followers. Yet in his early 40s, in seeming defiance of his fame, he placed his architectural practice in the hands of his draftsmen and women and left. First he went to Germany, accepting an invitation from a Berlin publisher named Basmut to print a portfolio of his architectural drawings, his complete life's work. And to the outrage of Oak Park, he left his wife and children and ran away with the married client of this house, Mema Borthwick Cheney. Renegades together, they spent a year abroad. In Tuscany, Wright set up a temporary studio. When he eventually returned, Catherine, the mother of his six children, refused divorce. 
he decided to abandon Oak Park for good, wrenching himself out of his domestic and suburban existence, leaving his symbolic ingle nook of hearth and fire. Wright took Mama Borthwick to the beloved valley of his restless youth. There, around a hill, on land given to him by his mother, he built a new home and named it Taliesin. But after two rapturous years, tragedy engulfed the house in flames, the rampage of an unhinged servant who murdered seven people, including Mama Borthwick and her own two young children, while Wright was away at work in Chicago. Years later, like a litany, he wrote, she for whom Taliesin had first taken form and her two children gone, swept away in a madman's nightmare of flame and murder. Black despair preceded a primitive burial in the grounds of the family chapel. We made the whole a mass of flowers. Steadily, stone by stone, board by board, the second Taliesin began to rise from the ashes of the first. Not a chastened Taliesin, a more reposeful and a finer one. Against all this, Wright completed his interrupted work on the Midway Gardens. A good time place, he called it, for Chicago to dance and dine. To many, he remembered, it was all Egyptian, very Japanese to others, but strange to all. Sadly, too strange to last. During the dry days of prohibition, which Wright always called the affliction, it was reduced to rubble his last Chicago building. But this was stranger by far. Not a temple for the Mayan gods, but a grocer's warehouse set down in the little Wisconsin farming town of Richland Center, a few streets away from where Wright had been born nearly 50 years before. Throughout his life, Wright presented his clients with irresistible renderings, none more so than the drawings for this vast enterprise of 1913. An invitation to design Japan's Imperial Hotel in Tokyo would occupy him for the next seven years. Built to withstand earthquakes from its foundations up, Wright floated his building on hundreds of slender concrete piles on a 60-foot deep pad of mud. Its cantilevers of brick and Japanese lava stone rode out Tokyo's devastating earthquake of 1923. But sadly, not the greedy developer's wrecking ball in 1968. The old-fashioned hollyhock, abstracted in concrete. The favorite flower of a Hollywood patron of the arts, Aline Barnstall. Wright called her home his California Romanza, a home for the celebration of the arts. Aline Barnstall, the socialite socialist was a complex creature, Wright remembered. Neither neo, quasi, nor pseudo. As near American as any Indian, as developed and traveled as any European, as domestic as a shooting star. In the 1920s, when Wright's specially designed furnishings were all in place, the skylight could be opened to the heavens. What rain that ever fell on California could fall here, as droplets in this moat around a hearty fire, a harmony of opposites. 
Wright left his first son, Lloyd, in charge of landscaping the gardens when he was away in Japan. Rudolf Schindler, the young Austrian architect who had come to study under Wright, was left to supervise the building. Hollyhock House was the forerunner of other California homes. Across the valley of Hollywood, the masses of the temple-like Ennis House rose like ramparts from an ancient jungle. To achieve his luxurious effects, Wright took that despised outcast of the building trade the concrete block. Using pattern molds of his own design, he had the blocks cast in a mix of powdered granite. Textile block construction was how Wright described the process, a weaving of light and shade under the fierce California sun. The monumentality suits the site, one observer carped, but the result is rather undomestic. Wright achieved his effects without the aid of historical devices. The old Mayan god of fire placed here above the hearth by the home's first owner disappointed Wright. He felt his house owed its spirit to the original architecture of the Americas. But the design was his, and his alone. But of all his California designs, La Miniatura was Wright's own favorite. A studio home for a book collector, Alice Millard. A library safe within these concrete screens of patterned blocks. An interplay of sun and shadow. Wright called this his first Usonian home, a word he coined in preference to American. There were other Americas, but only one Usonia, the first United Statesonian home. As America and the world headed into the crash and the Great Depression, commissions in architecture were few. Those lean years were spent on projects that came to nothing. Wright was reduced to living on his past as though his work were over by giving talks to universities across the states. He began work on his autobiography. He was now past 60. Fate struck once again. Taliesin was hit by lightning and burned once more For the third time, Wright rebuilt his home around this Wisconsin hill. 
Into this great living room, Wright gathered together his furniture, the designs of 30 years. In those dark years, the feeling of Taliesin's light and space must have saved his reason. More and more, Taliesin became his fortress, a refuge from the lurid accusations of the yellow press. For Wright was now besieged by the tabloids, seldom queried on his architecture, but on his personal life. In the years of rebuilding Taliesin, Wright had been helped by would-be artist Miriam Noel. She had accompanied him to Japan. Although their nine years together were often strained and fraught, Wright married her in 1923, the year his mother died. But soon a chance encounter would radically change his life. At the Chicago Ballet one night, Wright had fallen in love with a young follower of the mystic Gurdjieff, the daughter of a Montenegrin judge. Olgivana Lazovic. When their child was born, they again became front page news. Pursued by news hounds, faced by financial ruin, they even had to spend a night in jail before his divorce was finally granted. Once married, in 1928, they set upon a course of action that would, in effect, re-establish Wright as an architect. The old hillside school Wright had built for his aunts some 30 years before became the basis for the Taliesin Fellowship, a community of apprentices who would learn the roots of architecture, as much by working in the fields as on the drawing boards. Wright established the Taliesin Fellowship in 1932. The next year, ironically, Hitler closed the great German school of architecture and design the Bauhaus. Of all the structures actually built, the most impressive was the great drafting room. Its roof trusses, hewn from trees felled in the woods above and built by the apprentices themselves, inspired Wright to call it his abstract forest. Apprentices came from all across the country and abroad. Among the first was young Edgar Kaufman, Jr., an arrival of great significance for Wright. You all want to design things. You want to learn how to design things, of course. But you don't learn to design things by sitting at a drafting board with a pencil in your hand and a T-square and triangle. Now, I never sit down to a drawing board. And this has been a lifelong practice of mine until I have the whole thing in my mind. I may alter it, but unless I have the idea of the thing, and pretty well in shape, you won't see me at a drawing board with it. Who would guess that this remote Pennsylvania stream would relaunch the career of the 70-year-old architect? These woods were the favorite escape for the Pittsburgh department store owner, Edgar Kaufman, the father of Wright's Taliesin student. When young Edgar brought his father to commission a weekend home, he could hardly have imagined this. Falling water. Before a stone was laid, Wright wrote to Kaufman, the visit to the waterfall remains. A house has taken shape to the music of the stream. I thought you'd place the home near the waterfall, not over it, Kaufman answered. I want you to live with your waterfall, Wright replied. Not just look at it, but for it to become an integral part of your lives. Yeah. 
the actual boulder that had been the Kaufman's favorite family picnic spot above the waterfall, now shouldered through the floor beside the hearth as the fulcrum of the house. It seemed natural for Wright to cantilever the house out from that rock. Inside and out, the masonry was cut and laid like the natural rock ledges of the stream-eroded cliff. The smooth, reinforced concrete balconies were painted in natural buff to blend with the woods. Falling water. A house at one with nature, in perfect harmony with its site compounded out of numerous parts into one harmonious whole. This was the natural house. A house that welcomed the changes of the season. The horizontal sweeps of the cantilevered balconies and the vertical thrust of the stone and glass fireplace core anchored the house to its rocky ledge and echoed the plunge of white water over the falls. To Vincent Scully, falling water, like the Roby house before it, came to exemplify two persistent American themes. The first, of mobility, of flight, of getting away. The second, a rootedness and security. To write, falling water grew out of this gorge like a plant. How does nature build a tree? She builds it from the inside out. That's what organic architecture is. It's building the way nature builds. As he was building falling water in its cantilevered right angles, Wright was also conceiving this in elegant curves. The administration building for the Johnson Wax Company of Racine, Wisconsin, in 1936. Here, Wright encircled a basic brick structure with bands of glistening translucent Pyrex tubing. Once again, a client with imagination and power and money. Herbert Johnson was the president of his own private company. For him and his staff, Wright constructed a great cathedral of commerce, founded on the successful marketing of Johnson's household brands. Some of Wright's ideas lay well beyond the imagination of state building codes. To win his Wisconsin building permit, Wright arranged this dramatic public spectacle. Officials claimed that his elegantly thin concrete columns were too weak to support the roof. Ton by ton, he ordered one to be loaded up. The state engineers required the columns to support between two and 12 tons loading. With 60 tons up, Wright was allowed to start building. In fact, these slender columns supported little. <laughs> 
They were there to create a great communal working space in the spirit of the Larkin building of 30 years before. The walls of the building, which were merely screens below the bands of tubular glass, were made of a series of hard red bricks in an assortment of prearranged curves, raked out in long horizontal lines. The smooth curves celebrated the age of streamlining. A carport, integral to the master plan, complemented the best of contemporary automobile design. Wright heartily approved of the famous Cord. A tall research tower came ten years later as counterpoint to the almost feminine curves of the long, low, original building. Laboratories and workspaces cantilevered off a central stalk like the branches of a tree. Looking out from the inside, there was no view of the dingy downtown industrial landscape. Only patterns of light refracted through Wright's shimmering tubes of glass. I call this the great workspace. Its slender columns sprang from nine inch bases and supported concrete circles of 20 foot in diameter, 24 feet above the office floor. A complexity of cantilevers hidden in the simplicity of Wright's organic lily pad like forms. The building's so beautiful and attractive, I'll just put a cot in my office and live there, Herbert Johnson said jokingly. Oh, no, you won't, Wright returned. I'll build you a house. Wing spread, the Johnson residence. Wright called it his last great prairie house. this curving core of warm red brick, three fires could burn. The family could follow the movement of the sun around this open space through the different activities of a day. <laughs> 
a triumph of Wright's zoned living plan, a scheme he'd first developed some 30 years earlier in Oak Park. The craftsmanship lavished on this house, from the perfectly laid red bricks to the built-in furniture, was a perfection that Wright always wanted, but seldom got. Nevertheless, Herbert Johnson loved to tell about his first dinner party when the roof started to leak onto his head, in full view of his giggling guests. He immediately summoned his architect by phone. Wright replied, Well, Hib, why don't you move your chair? But all Wright's interests were not confined to dream homes for the rich. In 1937, Herbert Jacobs, a young Madison newspaper man, and his wife Catherine, challenged the 70-year-old architect to build them a home for no more than $5,000. What this country needs is a decent $5,000 house. So we asked Wright, can you build it? And he looked at us quizzically and he said, do you really want a $5,000 house? Most people want a $10,000 house for $5,000. We found that he was very interested in the low-cost house, and he said that he had been thinking about it for 20 years, and no one had ever asked him to do a low-cost house. Wright told us that this house was the first that he had ever built under contract, and he was as interested as we were in keeping the price to five thousand dollars and one of the one of the ways that he thought we could be saving was on using cull bricks from the johnson wax building which came in curves and different shades of red that was a big saving and he wanted again to emphasize the horizontal planes in the bricks to match the horizontal planes of the boards that made the walls. So he had the mason rake out the joints between the layers of brick. And for the vertical joints, he made them use a tinted mortar so that the bricks looked as if it was one band of solid reddish colors broken with different varieties of red. That was a lovely house to live in. We enjoyed every minute of it. Mr. Wright had told us when we first started, you know, you ought to go out to the country. You shouldn't live in the city. We decided that we'd take his advice. And in six weeks, we sold the house, bought a very rundown subsistence farm of 52 acres, and moved to the country from the sublime to the ridiculous. Mr. Wright made a trip over to the farm to walk over the hill where we thought, or the meadow where we thought we would place the house. He had his cape on his shoulder and his cane, and we walked through clover fields. And he finally came to a spot where he said, I think this will be the axis. And evidently it depended upon the prospects in various directions as he knew the house would open up to the out of doors. Susan had been watching, and she said, Mother, it's just like his making music. Wright scooped out the dirt of the sunken garden to make a sunken garden in front of the house and piled it at the back to form a berm which would protect the house against the cold winds from the north. The design of the house was laid out with a transit on six degree arcs, all the doors, all the partitions, the fireplace, the pools were all multiples of six degrees. There were no partitions downstairs. The measurement at the back of this semicircular form was about 100 feet. But because of the curve and the location of the furniture which Mr. Wright had designed, there was created what I called phantom partitions. <laughs> 
At one end was the kitchen huddled back into the stone walls, which opened out to the window area by the long dining room table, wrapped itself around the stone walls. But when you were in either end of that space, the curve and the furnishing sort of blocked out the rest visually. Wright named the house at the beginning a, the solar hemicycle, and it is interesting to note that it became, uh, many years later, recognized as the prototype for passive solar design, and many other houses have since been modeled on that basic concept. When he was explaining how the house would work for us, he said, there are two things that modern architecture can give to a house, the sense of space and the sense of shelter. And this house achieves it by the overhangs that extend out to give the sense of shelter. And the sense of space is through the whole layout of the architecture. The winter months at Taliesin were bitter cold and building stopped. So in 1937, to escape the worst of the season, Wright decided to build a rough and ready camp in the warm Arizona desert outside Phoenix. Well, the characteristic thing in the desert here is, of course, the desert itself. And I've always regarded it as the greatest lesson in construction, form following function, if you like, or form and function being one, that exists. Again, the Taliesin apprentices constructed the forms of what Wright liked to call his own desert masonry, a rich matrix of volcanically colored rocks in their natural shapes. Wright aligned a series of interlocking structures to echo the jagged peaks beyond. Taliesin West grew like an unprotected frontier camp, its margins blurred into the desert scrub. It was an open plan, utterly unlike the original Taliesin, which Wright built as a fortress of withdrawal. For the great drafting room at Taliesin West, redwood trusses, glass, and a roof of canvas shedding golden light. In the first year at Taliesin West, Wright conceived the master plan for an entire university, Florida Southern. The president of this independent, but then underfunded college, realized his vision by having his students begin building their campus with their own hands. A series of terraces and covered walkways, which Wright liked to call his esplanades, linked the college buildings. For his last Unitarian church, the Madison Meeting House of 1947, Wright chose the triangle for his theme of unity. Wright, who was now 80, 
had persuaded the congregation to build their church away from the inner city. For years, he had postulated his dream of rural life, a city in the country. He called it Broadacre City and had his students build a model of four square miles, an ever-expandable grid where all residential, industrial, and social needs were represented, where each family had a tillable acre of land. Into this imagined scheme, Wright dropped the odd high-rise building, a skyscraper with enough land to cast its own shadow. Since the 1920s, the idea of a true tree-like skyscraper had fascinated Wright. But he had to wait until 1952 to realize this project. The Price Tower in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. Wright loved to call it the tree that escaped the forest. Though its escape was in fact from the Bowery, a transplant from his 20s design for a New York tower. The building was constructed around a central stalk. The cantilevered floors carried parapets of copper facing, each side different, sensitive to the changing effects of sunlight around the compass. The noble tower rising out of the prairie became a pivot for Wright's ideas to replace the lust for ugliness, implicit to him in the spread of urban sprawl. Although Wright knew his city in a countryside would never be a complete reality, he developed his ideas to provoke discussion. A place that was at once everywhere yet nowhere. A long look back to the future, for he filled his utopia with buildings from his own past work a world all of his own design. Few modern architects designed more homes than Wright. This one, for the Cincinnati car dealer, Gerald Tonkins, Wright called a Usonian automatic. The theory was that anyone could build it. In fact, Wright sent a Taliesin apprentice to supervise the work, his own grandson, Eric Wright who last saw this house in 1955. Suddenly you're elevated to this high entryway, and, and then I... you go low again through the hallway into the living room, and I think it's a, it's a unique experience. I, I think that... In the early 1950s, Wright revived his ideas of concrete block construction. But unlike his Californian houses of 30 years before, here the blocks were used throughout. A coffered ceiling instead of wood and piers of concrete blocks pierced with the mitered glass he'd pioneered. His concept of this block house was that it was going to be a house for every man and that you That's could right. take these blocks and... Uh, everything is self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. This is a Usonian automatic house. Well, the, the, and, well, the idea of the have... automatic was that, that you could just stack the blocks. You see, the blocks were the module, right. were the unit system, and you just kept stacking the blocks. And anybody, it's just like building blocks for children. People are always asking, you know, how, how does this ceiling stay up? How do these concrete blocks held up? And yeah, what they I, have to realize is that that's this a, is, that's a, you know, uh, these are the integral steel bars coming in all through on a two-foot pattern here. Every two-foot square I, in, in running in every direction are iron bars. And then they're tied, they're in, tied each in corner. Right. Each and corner was tied. tied. Plus, in here, as they run along, as the bars run along, in these grooves, there's a core in there. The block makes a core, and that was filled with grout. That locked, that concrete grout locked the bar to the block so that what you had when you finished was an integral, reinforced. monolithic, reinforced concrete ceiling. And uh, it was a wonderful way of doing it. The glazers were working. They said the glass will never hold, and they called Mr. Wright. <laughs> 
And Mr. Wright happened to answer the phone. He said, Frank speaking. And uh, he said, look, you're the glazer, I'm the architect. You put the glass in the way I specified, and those mitered corners will hold a lifetime. Mm -hmm. You should live as long as those mitered corners yes. are going to yeah. hold. Wright was one of the first architects to conceive of concrete blocks as having the possibility of natural beauty. This home, uncoiling itself in the Arizona desert, was for his son, David Samuel Wright, whose business was the manufacture of concrete blocks. A ceiling of warm red Philippine mahogany arced over a specially designed handwoven carpet, a composition in circular forms that had begun to dominate most of Wright's designs. For years he had wished to combine the circle with the spiral. His chance to remodel a San Francisco gift store realized this interior. But the idea for a circular project on a grander scale finally found its germinating seed. Build me a museum for non-figurative art, was Solomon Guggenheim's exhortation and Wright returned with his master plan in a matter of weeks. The idea for a spiral building had long been in Wright's mind at least as far back as this unrealized project of the 1920s. A building of continuous space could now become reality. one American millionaire that ever faced the future when he died and put his little white alley on what he believed in for the future, and that was Solomon Guggenheim. Can you think of another American millionaire who ever did such a thing? Who left eight million dollars to advance a kind of painting that everybody was laughing at and laughing at him, and he didn't care, he believed in it, and he left his fortune to the future. Wright struggled to steer his unprecedented Guggenheim design through so many hoops of the New York building codes meant that he never lived to see his master work completed. One of the most controversial galleries in history, a triumph of spatial engineering, even though Wright's ideas were never fully carried through. a New York City landmark brought to life on the drawing boards of Taliesin by hands that could just as easily drop their pencils to rebuild a broken dam. When he died, 
a month or so before his 92nd birthday in 1959. There were many projects left to build, like his plans for the Marin County Civic Center in Northern California. These and other buildings were ultimately brought to life by his Taliesin associates in the years following his death. Now, I see in Marin County, in this opportunity before me and you, a great chance for free, open spacing, ground, room. Now, the Civic Center has a kind of an ominous ring. The sound of Civic Center is a little bit to those everybody was going to stand on everybody else's feet. But let's avoid that centering too much. Wright's ideas of democracy called for offices where all hierarchy was abolished. Like the Larkin building of over 50 years before, every room had direct access to the central well. But here they also had access to the great outdoors. Frank Lloyd Wright was buried in Taliesin's Green Valley by the little chapel his Welsh ancestors had built so many years before. Found on his drawing board was his last design, a simple new garden plan for Taliesin. When the materials are all prepared and ready, Walt Whitman wrote in Leaves of Grass, the architects shall appear. The greatest among them shall be he who best knows you and encloses all. <laughs> 